I'm just going to spend uh, a few minutes doing a quick check-in. And maybe before I, I start, I ask this every time, how many of you actually have been to this meetup before, the Weber City Boston meetup? And how many of you are working with WebRTC or real-time communications in some capacity? Right. Right. And are most of you, how many of you are web developers or do web development? And how about, how about mobile? All right. We have a pretty good mix of, of, of a little bit of everything, so, uh, which happens all this. So I'm going to spend a, a little bit of time here, do some real brief intro stuff. I've covered this a, a little bit every event. There's a lot of great resources. Definitely come ask me and, and some of the other WebRTC experts out there. Uh, if you need some help getting started with WebRTC or want to know where to go, I'm going to touch on a few topics, especially the ones that are going to come through in some of the presentations. Just for a little bit about me, I, I guess, you know, why, why am I doing this? One is I, I'm an independent consultant. I work with you know, real-time communications companies and helps and help uh, companies implement WebRTC. I mostly do you know, product management, product marketing type work. From the relatively early days of WebRTC, I started a blog with a few colleagues called WebRTC Hacks, which I still you know, maintain. It's a good resource. I get a lot of, you know, it's, not, it's not just me writing, it's actually mostly not me writing it. We go out and try to find experts on different topics um, to explain that and really serve the WebRTC developer community. Lately, I've also been getting a lot more involved in AI and you know how the intersection of real-time communications with topics like computer vision and uh, speech analytics. And I, I mentioned previously the Cranky Geek you know, event series. Again, if you're interested in additional talks, videos, this sort of thing, there's a much more there. So maybe to start, I, I usually like to talk about you know some specific examples or new companies or use cases or people doing things with WebRTC. So what are some of the things you can do with WebRTC? Well, you know, one good example here um, is uh, Peloton. You might have seen they're advertising quite a bit. My wife bought one of these about a year ago. This actually uses WebRTC to, you know, this is, it's basically a spin bike, what they have that you get for your house and the home. And they use WebRTC to live stream an instructor to basically a, a spin class in your house. So you have the feeling of being inside a spin exercise class with a bunch of people and seeing the instructor in real time, but you're in the comfort of your home, right? And they use WebRTC here for the low latency real-time streaming. Another great example, I don't know if there's, if there's gamers out here, you've probably heard of Discord, which is a gamer chat system that includes you know, not only type chat, but also audio, video, and screen share, uh, allowing them to save their games. They use WebRTC for all those functions, and especially in a gaming environment, uh, you know, multiplayer gaming, low latency is critical, uh, and WebRTC really helps there. WebRTC is not just about audio, video cameras, and, and, and microphones either, though, right? Uh, WebRTC also can help with just low latency peer-to-peer -peer streaming through firewalls. One of my favorite projects is WebTorrent, which is basically BitTorrent for the web, uh, leveraging WebRTC to do uh, BitTorrent streaming and you know, large file transfer type scenarios. WebRTC is actually also secure. It's great for secure communications. Edward Snowden, one of his activities is that he's involved in the Freedom of, of Press Foundation. They actually recommend WebRTC, in, in this case is an example of Jitsi, is you know, one WebRTC, you know, open source WebRTC application. But they recommend WebRTC because it's secure, encrypted, end to end. And you're able to run and load your own server uh, should you want to do, you know, do so for maximum security. Let's talk a little bit about what can you get with WebRTC. So the first thing in, in you know, the, the API here, I'm, I'm referencing the web APIs, but just bear in mind there are similar APIs available for native mobile uh, and other environments too. So you get camera and microphone capture. You can, you can grab a, a video feed and a microphone feed. But you know more than that, especially most devices now, or like I have you know multiple things plugged in, so you need to be able to determine which camera or which microphone you want to grab, right? So WebRTC also has the ability to enumerate devices, basically let you know which element um, to to pick. It also lets you pick your output audio device, right? Um, so if you have you know headphones, speakers, uh, you know front-facing, rear-facing, you know cameras, that sort of thing. Um, lets you, you know, select output audio devices. Another great use case application, it lets you uh, grab 
your a part or your entire desktop, right, uh, with the Git Display Media API for screen sharing use cases and applications. It also lets you record, right? So any of those media streams that you grab, um, you can record with the Media Recorder API. And as I mentioned earlier, WebRC is not just about WebRC. You know, also lets you connect those real-time communication streams from one party to another, and that's done via uh, the Peer Connection uh, API and a number of lower-level APIs. If you want to get into that, it's not just about media and you know humans talking to other humans. As I mentioned earlier, WebRC also has this great data channel functionality, which is set up and operates a lot like a WebSocket, but in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion, all right, between two browsers or two, two endpoints, all right, without having to have a, a server in between. And WebRTC, and this is actually one area um, that CallStats is uh, a, a particular expert in since they helped to write some of this spec. WebRTC also has APIs to give you statistics on, on how well your connection is running, about quality issues and, and bandwidth estimation, right? So there's there's all these this great set of APIs that are pretty comprehensive that give you a lot of power, a lot of capabilities. And in most cases, you know, these APIs, there's versions of them that are relatively high level that you don't need to go super deep. However, if you're operating a service and you want to go super deep, in almost every case, there's now, you know, lower level APIs that will give you more controls and allow you to do additional fine tuning should you want to do that. WebRTC actually, uh, it's taken a little while, but has pretty good support. I don't think anyone cares about Internet Explorer anymore. That's kind of a lost cause, but Google, uh, obviously pretty good. Mozilla uh, have had it for a long time. Microsoft Edge has actually had pretty good support. That'll be an interesting use case as they transition their engine from to the, the Blink engine. You know, hopefully they'll maintain parity uh, there, but it certainly doesn't seem like there's any reason to believe they're going to lose any WebRC capabilities. And Apple took them a little while. They're a little bit late to the game with things, but they've been making steady and very good progress in their implementation, uh, both for desktop and for iOS. Now, probably the sore point is actually running Chrome and Firefox on iOS, largely because Apple still requires that browser vendors use its own version of WebKit and you know Google and Mozilla, who have their own rendering engines, don't really want to switch over to that. Uh, and usually the WebRC stack follows that. We'll see how that plays out over time. But in general, you get WebRC pretty much everywhere. Now, there's also great support within most native environments. So mobile um, on Android, uh, you know, WebRC is initially started out as a Google initiative. They it's always been very strong support uh, on Android. Microsoft uh, is very much in the WebRC game. Um, there's a lot of great tools uh, and applications uh, for Windows UWP, the universal Windows platform that, that, that they've been adding in. And there's you know CocoaPods and a long list of other APIs for iOS. And as I mentioned now, even for Mac OS as, um, as Safari and the web get support for WebRTC, it's easier than ever to add WebRTC um, in real-time communications to your applications. And there's a lot of different ways to do it depending on your preferences and, and your architectural needs. So I did want to talk a little bit about servers because there are a couple of these topics that are going to come up. Um, there are servers that are needed. Um, you know, WebRTC is a peer-to-peer -peer technology, um, but you do need to have a signaling server to set up uh, the signaling, right? Um, Rob will probably talk a little bit about gateways, right? If you want to connect WebRTC to something like the telephone network, uh, and I'll talk about NAT traversal uh, in a moment. So one of the great things about WebRTC is it has the ability to help traverse firewalls um, and, and do network, you know, um, and deal with network address translation, right? To allow some of these peer-to-peer -peer connections. I'm not going to go into a lot of time, but I will say if you're a new developer, um, one of the biggest problems and challenges you see is people don't think about um, the stun and turn server. All right, stun servers are pretty, pretty easy. You actually get use you know, the, the Google ones for free. Turn servers are actually act like a network relay. Um, there's a lot of reasons why for whatever re you know, there's a lot of reasons why uh, point A might not be able to get to point B. Uh, in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion, right? In those cases, the turn server acts like a relay to do that. 
Usually it's like 10%, you know, maybe 20% in a strict fire, you know, strict enterprise firewall. Sometimes as low as a, a couple per, a percentage, right? But if you're running a production grade service, we're going to have, you know, hundreds, thousands of users. You're going to run into these scenarios. So don't forget the turn server. All right. You also might need to have a, a media server for different applications and use cases. And you know, the, the presenters today are going to talk about some of these. Um, I did want to just introduce a couple concepts just so you understand when it comes up in conversation. Um, so if you have, say, a bunch of people in this case, I'm showing six, right? Um, and you want to send a real-time communication stream between those parties, there's a couple different ways you can do that. The easiest and probably the, you know, the one that doesn't require any special infrastructure is just to send a bunch of different streams from party to party back and forth. The challenge with that is, as you can see, it starts to add up pretty quick, the number of streams that every individual client, and bear in mind this is a web browser, you know, the client is a web browser, it could be a mobile phone. Uh, it's pretty easy for it to get overwhelmed pretty quickly as that conference scales up, right? You, you end up with this exponential problem. The preferred, you know, kind of um, best practice method in most cases for dealing with that is to use uh, a media router type element uh, called a selective forwarding unit. Um, and this is a, just a special type of media server. Again, I bring this up because you're going to see it a few times just referenced SFU. Uh, but when you think, you know, see SFU, just think of this is a media server element that sits in the cloud that helps to direct uh, Weber C streams to, you know, the appropriate endpoints. And just to wrap up uh, before we get to our next speaker, I did want to talk a little bit about you know not just what WebRTC has today, uh, but also what's next uh, and what's coming with that. And the core WebRTC spec 1.0 is, for all intents and purposes, done. Right. So what's coming next? Um, uh, there's a lot of exciting things. I mean, one area that I you know I, I'm personally very excited about is just allowing WebRTC to leverage machine learning based you know applications like computer vision, like speech analytics, like doing speech effects, um, that sort of thing. Uh, so the standards bodies are actually looking into some of these use cases, and I love like they call this they have a, a funny hats use case, right? Um, and we've all seen these in you know social media applications where you put a mustache in somebody or or, or a hat, right? Um, they want to enable a lot of these things and allow you to do them easily inside a browser, right? Um, and you know, just as an example, but you know certainly going way beyond that. The original, you know, WebRTC vision had this idea of a peer connection, right? Which is basically one API that took care of everything for you, and your your application sat on top of that. That's not going to change. You know, that peer connection API is still there, um, but there has been a lot of work to basically add more controls and more capabilities and lower level APIs to WebRTC to uh, allow you to do more. This is already exists. A lot of this exists today. And you know, as WebRTC evolves and moves forward, more of these APIs are going to be exposed. And a really interesting talk that uh, Google gave at the last Cranky Geek event, they talked a little bit about how they want to be able to allow some of these APIs to plug into something like WebAssembly, where this would allow you to basically have maximum code portability. You can reuse the same code in your, in your, your native iOS or Android application compile it to WebAssembly and allow something, uh, you know, allow WebRTC to, to plug into that, you know, be that a, uh, a low level, you know, speech analytics or noise detection algorithm, That's a, they, they showed an example of that, or it could potentially even be some kind of specialized audio or video codec. There's also a lot of great new technologies uh, and advancements in technologies coming to uh, WebRTC. You might have heard of a, a new, you know, video call, you know, codec called AV1 uh, from the Open Media Alliance, right? Um, but the idea here is like, you know, bunch of major players today, basically all the you know major players inside media got together and decided that there shouldn't be royalty-based codecs anymore that people have to pay for, like it's the case with uh, H.264 today. These new codecs, you know, they allow much greater compression, much higher bandwidths for the same, you know, same processing power, or same bandwidth. So these really help push things forward. And another, you know, new transport protocol uh, technology, Quick, actually one, a, a Googler, Ian Sweat, a couple of years ago, gave a great talk on this actually here at WebRC Boston. This will open up some, some new opportunities and, and improve performance there as well.